I'm Amy and I'm with Howard Street. Uh, Chris, we Because the federal government finally 
says we can't impact King and Maple Street because that's against a new federal law. What happens from here? It's um, a toss up. But anyway, the Champlain Parkway, as it's designed now, will not be built. And any further parkway, if it is built, will not unduly impact King and Maple Street neighborhoods, which is low income and against federal rules. Especially, it's going to be impacted. 37% increase in traffic here in Home Avenue would have been 72% decrease. Terrible. Anyway, I am very excited. Oh, and uh, all the governors before this knew that no, none of the governors wanted this to happen. Unfortunately, the governor we have now was allowing it to happen. Not governor, mayor. Uh, I'm also on the Pine Street Corporation of Carolina. And let me just to take a minute and explain this, what's called an environmental justice requirement now. Uh, for years, there was nothing to stop uh, major infrastructure projects that affected neighborhoods, nothing to stop it from being built in low income neighborhoods, and they were. Uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, also one in uh, Buffalo. Love Canal, uh, on and on. I lived in uh, Louisville, Kentucky for a while, and uh, there was a working class German neighborhood that had been there for a hundred years, and the city decided they needed to get rid of their trash, and they wanted to burn it. So they built a big incinerator right in the middle of this uh, low income neighborhood. And uh, what had been called Germantown suddenly became, uh, was known as Smoke Town. And the air was, it was so bad there you could hardly breathe. So that's the sort of thing that these, uh, this uh, environmental justice requirement now, this part of uh, major infrastructure. And that's how it came about. So, uh, it has to be analyzed and uh, it's, it's all part of the process. And it's only in the last few years that that's happened.
meet up on online. It's a great opportunity. I think it's a really great step in the right direction. One of the beautiful things for me personally is they have negated the need for an additional parking spot for that and have allowed for stacked parking. So I should be able to get my accessory dwelling unit converted efficiently. But it should be a really a good step for the housing issues that we have. Just want to say that. Thank you. Sure. When you say it's a hearing, does that mean people are going to be talking about things? Or it's a public hearing, so it gives it gives the community a chance to ask questions, to say we love this idea, we hate this idea, we like new regulations, we hate new regulations. And are you going to show us some things too? There'll be a PowerPoint of, and you can look online to see all of the the old regulations and then the crossed outness and new regulations, and that can be found. Um, I think specifically on the Housing Summit section of uh, the Burlington website. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for the memory, Jake. I've been hearing that word um, snurfer, which was the predecessor to snurfer a lot today um, on NPR. Yeah. Thank you for a lot of questions. Great, so thanks so much for sharing during Open Forum. I'd like to turn it over to Vicki to share a little bit about King Street with that's all. Group. And I'm used to talking with kids, so I'll be loud. And I recognize that this is challenging. Thank you for acknowledging Jake. He actually, the Found Foundation has been very supportive of King Street on our tennis program and, of course, the children programs. So he was absolutely in our thoughts today. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the chance to visit King Street Center to, to host. We're delighted to host the meeting. Um, Mohammed, you kind of stole it because you say it uh, in such passion. So thank you uh, for that big reminder. Uh, King Street Center has uh, been around almost 50 years. We'll be celebrating our 50th year in 2021. So we're already starting to think about that history in the neighborhood. It's important to know that it really started very grassroots. It was a group of moms who gathered um, in the laundromat down the street back in the early 70s saying, you know, what are my kids doing after school? And that is a, a constant uh, narrative with a lot of mom, moms and dads today as well. But through their efforts, they were able to collaborate with UVM, their student volunteers, their uh, St. Mike's Move Office, and other um, student groups to really help provide them with support, fresh ideas, and then moving forward with more of that uh, professional connection with the social work department at UVM. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I'm, I'm just working very prideful of those grassroots uh, endeavors, so I always like to mention that. We uh, serve kids as young as 18 months up through high school, and then students like Bobby <coughs> continue to come back and visit us when they're in college. And I know uh, my colleague, Lucia, here, as much as we talk about the, it's all in the prep, the value and importance of early education, it is, we know this. Our, uh, our value cry these days is really for those school age kids who seem to get uh, dropped in a lot of ways. So let me tell you that we start with a toddler program, 18 months to age three, and a preschool program, three, four, and five year olds. Those programs are uh, collaborative with Head Start, which allows us to really provide wraparound services for our uh, kids and families, mental health support, family visiting, ensuring that every child enrolled has a family uh, physician and a dental home. Um, the Head Start care advocates work with uh, parents on employment and all sorts of issues that really can um, create stress that then creates an environment that is not as easy for children as it, it can be if those adult stressors are um, addressed. We, it's full day, full year, 7.30 to 5.30. We provide breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack. We have a family through the bus, so we're able to take really awesome field trips. They have access to the gym until the lab that school age kids arrive. Uh, and of course, we have such great partners. So let's grow kids. Uh, visit the Nurses Association. Our Burlington School District is in our classroom every day. Um, we feel just so gratified to have such a passionate community and partners that really enhance our work. 
after school. We have about um, 55 elementary school age children that join us uh, from Champlain and Edmonds Elementary. Those are our two feeder schools. And they're here uh, every day after school. And in the summer, we uh, camp up to a full day camp program for eight weeks. Again, breakfast, lunch, and afternoon snack. Most marvelous partnerships, again, really enhance our work. Very Mary Theater, Audubon, uh, Drumming, BCA, these are um, collaborative partnerships where they, they actually do not charge our children. They don't charge the street center to embrace the kids as part of their programming. We just need to often get them there through our bus um, and other ways. A lot of walks and trips. The wire. Uh, can't wait for the new structure to open uh, in January, and our children are already doing a lot of water play there. They'll be um, actually engaged in swimming instruction, which now is um, so vitally important for most especially newcomer children who often have not had the experience of swimming lessons. Uh, as you may or may not know, we serve high numbers of um, newcomer families, as Mohammed mentioned, and um, general families living with low income. That means everything along the spectrum. We have a structured youth program, middle school, high school, teen futures, which is Really, uh, again, about a uh, tremendous amount of support with their academics, as well as um, it's trendy to say filling that opportunity gap. We use the word opportunity, I think, since our beginning days, but really that is what it's about, is making sure that um, money in the back pocket does not get in the way of children having the opportunity to engage in other opportunities that, that cost something. This is a way we know we keep our community vibrant, we keep our kids engaged, they feel a sense of ownership, a sense of belonging and connectedness, and really that, that is our work. I love this building. This building will be five years old in January, and so we're right from love it, and the ladder comes our here behind the door. But our work in every program is, work, it is about outside the door. We need to feel prideful, we need to feel connected, and that's how um, all children are so that's a big, big piece of our work is just getting them out and about and in an integrated setting. So they're taking a dance class at the plan with um, the child whose parent grade will pay for that, that uh, private class. They're doing horseback riding, well, they just finished horseback riding in the stables of a little children. Um, and then we do ad hoc family programs as well. We did a computer, a computer literacy program in the summer in partnership with. USCRI, formerly referred to as uh, Refugee Resettlement Program. So we're, we're a busy place. Uh, we always say we see about 130 to 150 children and youth a day. We have about 30 staff um, on board. Actually, we are under hired if you know of anyone. I think every sector is struggling with um, workforce, and, and we are one of those places most definitely. But you are always welcome to come back and take a tour. Uh, we have a lot of familiar. tell you December 9th is our annual holiday dinner for our families and for, for guests in the neighborhood. The Windjammer has hosted this dinner, it's in our gym, has hosted this dinner for about 30 years. I think this is the 29th and they've been in the Cater the whole thing. It's a very welcoming feel. So if you're not doing anything Monday, December 9th, Champ will be here uh, distributing lots of Lake Monsters Thank you. 
what we're going to fight for first, and then what control after that. Segregation, so that we can live anywhere, ever in the city, may not be segregated to certain sections of town, where the housing is the poorest. And then we'll just go on from there. Hopefully we can get up to the state level and get this stuff taken care of. In the upcoming months, we hope to be having a lot of dinners to get all these renters together and we can go work as we need to so we can start getting this work done and we can help out with the renters. We'll be having, in December, we'll be having a Know Your Rights Forum. So all the information that we have is on all the social media sites. We have the Twitter page, we have Facebook pages, we have our own tenants site, the GrowingTenantUnion.com. You can go on there and we have all different kinds of information and they can get one-on-one -on -one chats on Facebook as well. So that's what's going to happen. Questions? Is there any other way to get information besides online? Besides online? Besides online? Besides online? Is there any other way to get access to the information? Absolutely. I, I didn't have enough of these pamphlets with me today, just this one. But we are uh, trying to figure out where our funding is coming from right now. But it's about 10 of us <coughs> that have all started this out, and we're struggling to get cash to, to print these out. I will have more of these. I will have Bonisi uh, Way bring in a pile of those. Bonisi Way is also with us, and she works for the and I'll have her uh, bring in some more of these so that everybody like they can come here and get one of these to have more information on, on contacts and stuff. Any other questions? When do you need? Right now, we're saying we just had our government <coughs> summit. Our next meeting is coming up within the next couple of weeks. Happy Thanksgiving. We don't want to impede the, the holidays because of the this. I'm going to be gone. I'm on vacation. The seventh thing we're hoping for. There's a, a big push in the city and in the state to build more housing. Yes. Um, do you think that building more housing uh, helps uh, the situation for renters? It all depends on exactly what's being built. Because as we've seen, a lot of the places that are being built now, like um, use Redstone, for instance. Over on 95 North Avenue, Redstone put up a building, and their two-bedroom apartments in there are $2,700 a month. And they're charging $1,500 a month for 500 square foot of room. So it all really depends on exactly who's building it and what's being built. Lower income housing is not being built as much as it needs to be. Everything that's market rate, market rate is not affordable for people that are low income. It's been proven time and time again. They can't afford to live in units. Right now, the, the records show that you basically have to be making $23 to $25 an hour to rent in the Burlington area. It's reduced heat, Colchester, Essex, anywhere outside of that, cheaper, but there's not a lot of low-income people that can afford cars. So building more is good, but it really depends, like I said, on who's building it. And it's at what part of the city is getting built in, too. Because if it's getting built on the hill, we are going union and up. That's called the hill section. And again, it's not affordable for the there's, there's, there's something that since you had to a certain percentage of any apartment building that's out in the low income section eight or yes there is there's supposed to be if i'm not mistaken there's supposed to be at least 32 percent of all apartments in any building that gets built that's supposed to be for low income people they have not been following it they have not been forcing the builders to follow this the new mall 
that they've got going in and the housing is going to be in there, their rental units are going to start at $1,500 a month for a month. As of right now, that is not going on. It's not a single one of the I know that's going to be able to take them out. No, we don't do The city council, that's, that's where we're going to start getting all this stuff changed. It's the only way it's going to change. We've got to do better to help each other out. If we don't start helping each other out, there's going to be a very expensive ghost town, and I'm thinking, because everybody's going to be here, but nobody's going to get it. At least it's just going to pay everybody's going to go out. No, they don't. They give them very little fines. The landlord that we're running from right now is business. And it's horrible. They have already endured three or four games at 10 degrees without heat. They, uh, the roof over our stairway is completely falling apart. Code enforcement knows about all the issues in the building. And they turn around and they look at stuff and say, well, it clearly writes in code that these are violations. And they look at you pointed out, like the roof over our stairs, the machines are just so low, they're blown off the place. They looked at that and said that was a problem. They came over about three weeks later and covered them. They did not take the water below them. They did not take the water shingles on They did not take the soot filtering metal They came over, they put polystyrene board that had cement paper on both sides over the top of it and slap rubber on that and put a dead leg on it. And that was it. The boards are still alive. The sticking out pieces are falling off. They just don't enforce the codes. Is, is code enforcement through the city hall or is it through the city? Yes, it still is. Yeah. It still is. Um, so, uh, space in the man's name and runs it. But it would be. Bill Ward. Thank you. Who? Bill, Bill Ward. Ward. Bill Ward. That's what it is. W A R D. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I had this person at home and he knew it was. He was actually at my house in the morning, telling me that each room in my apartment there was no problem. See, each room in our apartment is a different temperature. When he is applied, he knows it's all supposed to be the same. I've got a gap in my doorway. Air is coming in. Cold air is coming in, and I take care of my 75 year old mother, who's a diabetic and has my blood pressure. But yeah, there's no clear violations. So he's not doing anything? No, I guess. This is still an emergency fund. Oh, absolutely. I would definitely be using it. For what it's worth, uh, so I, I thank you for coming here, and I think that the organization is a really valuable message. Um, for five years, I served as the chair of the Housing Board of Review, which hears security deposit disputes. That's what we do. And sometimes we would connect with the Code Enforcement Office. And my experience with Bill Ward, the Code Enforcement Office, is that um, they've actually done a very good job, but with a law that doesn't go far enough. Uh, when Bill took over the Code Enforcement Office, there was a huge backlog of apartments that simply hadn't been inspected at all. And I think that Bill and his inspectors have done a, a, a great job of at least getting into apartments and seeing them and being responsive. And I'm glad to hear that you had this phone number there. My perspective was that the minimum housing code, which is what they enforce, that those minimums are, are so low uh, that That's their hands are tied with respect to uh, them being able to do more. And so I think it's great that the city is considering these weatherization efforts to modify the minimum housing code. Um, I, I don't think it necessarily needs to stop there, though. I think that oh, no. the way you could get, I think the way you get Bill and the code enforcement office you know, more authority and more power, because I think they're there and they're ready to, 
to do the job is to is to increase the standards. And so I'm glad to hear that the city council is looking at that. I'm glad to hear that. Exactly. We have to, if the code enforcement office themselves actually have to do the jobs, they're not, they, like I said, they come over and they look at all the things that we have going on in our building. Like you said, the machine is falling off the roof. You know, these landlords should be getting fired repeatedly. And I've got all the paperwork necessary for everything that we've been dealing with with our apartment. And it says parts on paper. And the amount of fine is zero. Yeah, zero. It means they did not get fine. And there's open cases on just their building alone. And they're still they're not pushing these landlords to make these. But yes, some of the problem is the codes themselves are just not good enough. We need to bring the standards out. So that's part of what we're doing. fighting for as well. And as far as enforcement, they can. That's part of their, their thing. They can force these landlords to do this. So but yes, we do have to raise some standards. Because what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to They can go to any one of our sites online, or yep. Facebook, or Twitter. We do have these at the library. Um, like I said, I'll give a, let me see what we want to do. I'll give her, we'll give her a staff link to link here, so that if people want to come here and get them, they can. Um, our moderator phone numbers are on our site. They can contact any one of us on there. That's great. And what we can do, too, is put this information on the Facebook page, so folks can access it. Yes, I will give you the PDF. Perfect. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, what we've tried to do is actually incorporate just a quick five, seven minute chance to get up and stretch, grab a snack, use the restroom if you need to, and we'll come back together at 7 30. John Vickery, if you don't mind just saying a little bit about like, who you are as a person and how do we connect to you in the ward before you dive into the rest of it. Thank you. <laughs> so, hi neighbors, I'm a, I'm a ward fighter as well. Oh. Uh, you <laughs> John Vickery. So I'm the, the Burlington Assessor. I've been with Burlington for 18 years. Um, I've been doing reappraisal work for 23, 24 years. For, um, actually, I'm myself. Um, and let me know if you can't hear me. Just do this. I'll, I'll speak up. Um, so, the city of Burlington is doing another citywide reappraisal, which has been mandated by the state of Vermont. They, they tell towns, municipalities, when they need to do a reappraisal. And it's statistically based, and uh, our stats did not measure up. Uh, so we've been mandated to do this reappraisal. It's a fun thing. I, I enjoy the analysis. I apologize for your problem. Can you just give us a little synopsis of what a reappraisal is? Oh, sure. Okay. I don't know. Okay. A reappraisal. I don't apologize for it. Is, is, okay. I was going to spin it in a funny way. It's a reappraisal is an opportunity for you to get a new valuation for your home. Uh, so we, we're going to reevaluate all uh, taxable properties. Properties as well, um, and we're going to be taking our assessments, which were set in 2005, so they're not at market today. The market in Burlington, we're lucky, has been improving over the last 13, 14 years, and values are higher now. So the reappraisal is a resetting of our values to market, and um, that's what we're doing. We're in the process of this. We started this uh, almost a year ago uh, with. Uh, a number of contracts and, and, and switching over our software and so forth, beefing up our staff. Um, we have uh, hired a reappraisal company. Uh, they are based out of Texas, but they have a reappraisal division from Connecticut, and they uh, send in all of our data, and they, they run all the numbers, and they also have people that come here on site, and they do inspections and so forth. And so we had sent out about a month ago to all the pro all the residential property owners a letter announcing, uh, hey, this is what we're doing. We're doing a revaluation. Uh, we hired Tyler Technologies as a company. 
And on the back side of the page, there was a little bit of data on uh, if you're a property owner of your property, and we asked, hey, let us know if there's something wrong. We really want to involve the, the uh, property owners to get our data correct if it's incorrect. And we've been getting a number of responses on those and we've been making those corrections. Then we also, if you are uh, an owner of a commercial property, we more recently sent out another mailer on that asking for additional information. It really involves uh, citizens of Burlington property owners to help us out. We can do a better job if the data is as correct as possible. I'm gonna just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes and then I'm going to open up the floor with questions. And then let me know when I'm because I know other people have this one. The timeline uh, is in January of 2021. This is a two year project, and in January of 2021, we will uh, mail out the results of the valuations. We will also have uh, people's property data online as we've had for the last 10 years. Um, so people will have an opportunity to connect value with the data and also be able to look at other folks' properties because we're an open book, or this is a public process. And um, they will have an opportunity to meet informally with the, the, the reappraisal company and our own staff too, because we're gonna be involved. And we will make additional corrections um, if needed. We will also, if required, we'll do more inspections. Um, so that is in uh, January of 2021. Um, so the tax bills with the new valuations will occur in July of 2021. So it's a little, it's a little bit out, but it, it's because it's such a long process. It's basically a valuation that affects all properties in Burlington. That, that, that is, I guess that's all. I don't know if there are questions I just want to let everyone go for. Yes. How many houses or buildings are there that are relevant? Um, there's, second question. Is there any way we can start dealing with the thought back in our city on the next category? So the first, the first part of the question, there's approximately 11,000 properties in Burlington, and um, there, uh, out of that 11,000, oh, that includes business personal property, there are about 400 tax-exempt properties. Some of those, like our larger institutions, they make payments for services, they make some, they, some type of payments, and uh, I've been with three uh, mayors and administrations, and, uh, from time to time, the contracts get reviewed, renewed, and um, everyone wants to ask for more, and uh, there's always a little negotiating back and forth before it gets settled. Um, yeah, it'd be great if those folks that everyone that uses services would be paying for that. That's, that's out of my, my jurisdiction. I, I basically want to make sure that values are, are fair so that the tax revenue is Distributed even payments in this certain number. John, I think we actually probably talked by phone. Um, I had a construction project which flagged um, the re inspection. And so um, I think that was, you know, we have 11,000 buildings to inspect, but not really, because I just recently had it done. I got reevaluated uh, or reappraised, excuse me. And so, you know, kind of just some feedback, and I something on the site that said, if you've had it, you know, just to lighten your loads, if you've had your house re-inspected, or re-evaluated, uh, re appraised you bought it from this state to this state, you know, just giving you guys something on the site that maybe allows for people that have had that to know what to do, or to not, that they're good, they don't have to do anything, things like that, but that should reduce the number of people that you have to go through. So it's just more of a customer service thing of having something on the site that's like, if you've recently been reappraised, what to do? You know, do something, do nothing, just kind of things like that. 
could be just helpful. So you're suggesting that if you were recently reappraised something that stopped in your house two years yeah. ago. To, uh, this year. This year. Yep. The data is on your properties probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Chances are we're not going to send someone to pay that. We have a limited amount of resources in the minute. We're raising their expenses to over a million dollars. And uh, so we would not do that. Um, the value is still being reviewed and probably adjusted, but the inspection does not need to occur to your property. It would probably go to a property that has been inspected in a long time. And that's how that will work. We won't be getting into every single property. Uh, our analysis uh, is of about 40% uh, is what will be attempted to in some of those new exterior types of new exterior types. Yes? Yeah, I know it looks like it costs a million dollars in the But I'm thinking about something. We have people who made 50 years ago who bought a house. And of course, these land are not under the school system. Yes, sir. It's land too. It's land too. Uh, and you know, they're retired, they put on social security, and they lost them. Now it's just a bunch of So, what do you do in that kind of situation? So, I want to repeat your question. What's that? Can you repeat the question? Yes. I'm going to repeat your question. Uh, so, the question, the question was what do we do uh, regarding uh, valuation of uh, property? Uh, for someone that has bought a house a long time ago, and um, what, what's what, what's the well, uh, the answer is we have to abide by state law and appraise properties for their market value. Uh, there is provision in the law uh, if someone is has a, an income of a certain level, they through the state they hopefully they declare a homestead on that property and they uh, also do their taxes. And we get information from the state tax department that gives them a, a minus adjustment on their tax bill. And uh, that, I think, is uh, a way that uh, folks of uh, more modest income can stay in their property. That's the only legal mechanism that there is right now. Why don't they just uh, take the house and sold? That there's no law for that right now in Vermont. Yeah. 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 I think they used to call the income sensitivity adjustment, but I, I don't know if they've shy away from that term. But there's an adjustment, and a lot of folks benefit from that for sure. There's. I see. Maybe you don't, you don't have an answer to this question. I see on the last slide, the last bullet point is reappraises impact on individual property tax bills, question mark. Yeah. Is, is there an answer <laughs> to that question? Yeah. Or? So I was waiting for the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, um, so this is how it works in a, on, a, on a grand scale. Yeah, we have uh, $3.8 billion worth of total taxable value when we finish up with this reappraisal, our grand list, call it grand list, will be 4.8 billion, approximately, give or take a couple hundred million. So you're going to have this increase. Our tax rate is going to be lower. Right now, it's 84 cents per hundred, the municipal tax rate. That'll that'll drop to like I'm not going to say exact, but like 65 cents per hundred of value. So. The, the result is supposed to be this revenue neutrality where um, it's not a windfall in the budget. The budget will be what the budget is unless the voters and the council approves a higher budget. And they, if they're not going to approve a much higher budget. They're going to say, we need to collect uh, $30 million, or maybe in the following year, maybe it's $31 million. So higher values lower tax rates so that there's an offset so that the amount raised is about similar to what it was the year before. That's typically how it works. Now, uh, I'll bring it to the local level. Um, over the past 13 years, properties have 
have appreciated at different rates. And I can say appreciate, because most properties have appreciated. We haven't had depreciation here in Burlington. And um, depending on where you are located and uh, the type of property you own will dictate the impact that you'll have. There'll be people that will, will pay more in taxes uh, because they'll be taking a larger portion based on value. And there'll be other folks that own property that might benefit and actually see a little bit of a reduction in that. There'll be a bunch of people that are about the same. Um, Overall, our equity is, is relatively reasonable. It's just outside of the parameters of the state guidelines that we're going to correct that. Can I say? Sorry. Sure. sure. Oh, please go ahead. I've asked the question. Please. The South Bend, I think, probably is appreciated more than. That was my point. We have to be on my board. We do this. It's actually, that is true. We have the benefit of more market appreciation over the past 13 years than other parts of the city, and that'll get corrected. But that fortunately probably means is that South Enders, like myself, will probably pay a little more taxes as a result of this work. Now everyone's quiet. So what we what we did? Oh, you had a young woman take photos of your house. Um, we did a little different. We um, we no, we had we had we hired a company to drive up and down the streets like a Google uh, car. You know, when they drive up and, and just takes these photos. So that's how we have her images done a little differently these days. If someone's doing an inspection, occasionally we will take a photo uh, and then we can put it into the system as well. But we didn't hire a crew to take all the photos. So you did this report? Yeah, can I have one more follow-up question? Sure. Uh, it, it seems to me just as someone who just casually you know, keeps an eye on the real estate market and so on, that that we're really at um, like a, a peak now with respect to values, and especially over the last couple of years in the South End, it seems that house prices have increased extraordinarily. And so, I suppose what I'm wondering is, does do the folks who use for the reassessment? I mean, do they do they take that into consideration that we may be at a peak in a broader timeline here? I mean, is it, it, is there any consideration put into the fact like? Yeah. Are, are we doing this at the right time or the wrong time, depending on? Well, I, I don't the know um, that answer. The uh, I've seen several market cycles, and not just in Wellington, but since I started my career in this, and um, the market doesn't change overnight. It slowly goes up, it slowly goes down, and it stays relatively level. Um, so it's not going to be a dramatic swing, but it may soften. I don't know. Um, what, we, what we're doing is we're basing our values on the sales that have occurred. So it's a little bit of a lagging study, and we will look at the most, put most weight on the most recent sales, and then as you go farther back into the second year, a little less weight, you could maybe make adjustments for time. It's statistically done. And so it'll be the snapshot, and everyone will be at the same snapshot, so to speak. If we have something like 2008 uh, and there's a, a dip in the market, we can adjust our tables by adjusting factors and making adjustments to that. I hope that doesn't happen. I'd rather have it just slow down or something. Because it's kind of a headache. Okay, one last question. What is our city's budget trying to be for What is the city budget? That we have to meet. Um, Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to give you that number. I, I think it's around 30. Anyone else know? I, I don't know. I know that the, the police and the fire are very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't want to say because I'm not as sure. So at least that's somewhere in the ballpark. It's a lot of money. 
How can you focus on that text here today? Uh, sure. Uh, um, I'm ready to see all on the ground floor. Um, if you come in and renew your property, actually, you do it with me. I take time with the property owners all the time. And uh, we have a small staff, they do what they're doing, they're trained. Um, and we have obviously a lot of information on the website about the reappraisal specifically and just general stuff. And if you're, if you're a property owner, the, your property is on our database and there's information right there. So, Great. Yeah. Thanks Thank so much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a way we can help you? Like maybe we take a photo of our houses? Okay. Uh, we have photos, but if you want to stop into the office sometime and we'll, we'll, we'll review the property. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We can make corrections if there's errors. I'm happy to do that. That's what we want to do that.
no, no case like you would think today of the way the car is used would get a rational ticket. <laughs> it was doctors, people, wheelchairs, people like that. So, uh, and that's just a couple of things. Sugar, I don't know if there's anyone old enough to remember the war, I guess not. Okay, so, uh, well, you must be very good kids. <laughs> My grandfather would say, the box shoes. Yep, yep. Almost everything. Almost everything. And they did it, and I, and I gotta say, people were not in favor of it. Some might say, but some were, some weren't. A lot of people would check. But within a few months, um, that changed. There was a sense of natural purpose. Exactly. Exactly. And it's considered, without that, they're not sure we would because that was happening at the same time they were vetoing early. I think it was in, it was in 1942 that the government said they ordered auto manufacturers do not make any more cars. And that was before those guys even had the contracts, the government contracts, to build all the uh, things that they did for the war airplanes, tanks, jeeps, trucks. Uh, and as, as you know, there's no other deal. I don't know what the years are. Probably year 42 and all the way to 44, 45, maybe I think even 46. No cars were manufactured. Uh, heaven, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, my point is, we are not doing that now, and we really need to, if we really could. Just imagine what a great thing it would be if the governor uh, declared an emergency and if the executive order said, we are going to show this country that we can cut our emissions immediately, like they did during World War II. So they hadn't built the new economy yet, but they still responded immediately. So until we have, until we have all the electric cars, all the electric buses, and the future that we hope to have, immediately we should stop using so much fossil fuel. And I always say this about Vermont, people say, well, you know, really, what's the difference Vermont is going to make? It's not our mission. That's not the point. It's just like trying to convince someone who doesn't like the vote because they think their vote doesn't matter. It's just one, and they haven't seen a whole lot of elections to turn up on person to vote. But for those of us who are always trying to convince people to vote, it's the same argument. So it doesn't matter how small our state is. And what does matter is how Agile, we are as a government, believe it or not, compared to other governments, because we're small, because we're so democratic, and it's not as difficult for us to act. That's why we can do it. We've done this a couple of times before, in my time, others that have other chances on remember 1989. <coughs> 1989, we passed a, a bill to cut our uh, uh, CFC. Yeah, CFC is floral. Yeah, what's the floral? Floral CFC, Freon. We were the first state in the country, including the federal one, to regulate cars. At the time, cars were provided to them. Again, did it matter so much the amount of Freon leaking from automobiles in our state? In those days, most people didn't have air conditioning. It was an option that almost all of them said no thanks to. But now it's become something you can't even get a car like and the one thing I do remember about that when I was serving the legislature was that the car dealers were saying, now they're all going to pull up the launch and they can't possibly make it. I think it was six months after the legislation went into effect, they were advertising CFC free air conditioning. So it was in the works while they were talking about that it was impossible to do it. So that was really an island in the But my point was that leadership, that was the Oh, it wasn't our emissions. And, and the very next year, 1990, Congress passed what's called the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990. The Clean Air Act, by law, nothing changed all those years since about 1970, long 72. Uh, and they were changing it. And they put in a CFC section for the first time. Um, they were calling me up. Our board's office was calling me up. And, uh, frankly, not my but. Uh, Al Gore and John Kerry's office, wondering how do we do this? How do we pull it off? 
and they would, it was easier for them to pull it off the computer. So, so that's my introduction. Um, uh, I don't know if you want me to talk about what uh, uh, maybe you do. Yeah, let me yeah. talk a little bit. Uh, um, um, when I first, I, I, this is my second student in the legislature. I served in the foundation. When I first showed up there, uh, I mean, I thought I had a big career. It's kind of, you know, people who naturally go on natural resources. Both of us have served in that committee for a while. We both chair it. We both chair it at different times. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, when I went there in the 90s, they were calling the transportation committee. And some of them still referred to it as the highway committee. And at that point, I asked a few different times, like, maybe I should switch over to the transportation committee because they really need to start thinking differently. Um, I think last year, for the first time, there are not five of us who think pretty much exactly the way we do. That will really start envisioning our transportation future totally. And um, when we get there, you know, last year, we were honestly handed the budget that's like this thick. Uh, it was a little intimidating. When we get it about a week or two after we sat in session. Um, and um, it's, you know, we, we, I think we did our best to start changing, but we've had a lot of meetings over the summer saying, you know, is the governor's going to be talking about joy, um, you know, staying in the Paris climate for and believing in our uh, goals for emissions reductions. He cannot be sending us budgets that don't reflect that. So um, we have made it very clear that we expect to see um, a budget that is much more reflective of uh, the greenhouse gas reduction goals in the Paris Climate. The Highway Committee was the name of the committee. Mary used to call it the car committee. <laughs> <laughs> Most ways it still is. For the most part, it still is. We are trying hard to change the view. So, speaking of, uh, of that, I, I just completed uh, a uh, bicycle slash transit tour of the state, visiting with every one of my committee members, including Mary, who was the closest. <laughs> but I did right did, did down there and sit on Mary's line along with her. Um, and it was really quite an indication, obviously. I, Ridden my bike around the state quite a bit, but never as a chair of transportation. And kept, I kept seeing things. The worst things I saw were the condition of the highways and sections of the highways for bicycles. Uh, you know, no shoulder, sometimes when there's no shoulder a guardrail right there, a bicycle is absolutely stuck in that space. And if something goes wrong, someone's reading a text, a text or something, you got no place to go. Um, and actually, I learned on, on this trip that two people that were killed in such situations and in contact with their families and see if they were willing to, to talk or just to meet or maybe even to the committee about that. Our transit systems, you know, I try to tell you what occurs to me about those. I wrote quite a few of the buses. I have now ridden on at least one bus in every one of our six or seven transit agencies around the state. They're doing a really good job and they have improved the services quite a bit really improved the interconnection. For instance, one, when I left Pulte, uh, it was raining hard, it was all day, so I was able to take buses from Pulte all the way home. Uh, three different buses, but just a few years ago, you couldn't even do that. And what I want to say about, about the transit in our state, yes, we're a rural state, but uh, if you look at uh, poor countries, that are still most well that they're urbanizing, as you know, people are moving to their capitals for employment. But um, uh, still, in those countries, people use transit regardless of They come out to the roadway and they, and they get a bus. And this has worked so well in those countries because there aren't a whole lot of rules. You can flag them down and stuff. They want the customer. You know, here, I don't know if anyone's tried to get on the bus even at, at Church Street. They won't stop. Even though there's, the bus is totally stopped. They stop at one of these doors. Right. Well, they stop because it's a stop sign. And because it's all that one for the pedestrian track. They always stop at the stop. And they're pulling out the police. Um, do you want to talk about the Yes, but what I'm getting at in transit is that what we need is the 
people to use transit. Because if the numbers go up, it's going to be much easier for us, it might become possible for us, to argue for more money for transit. It's hard to do that if the numbers are, the numbers, I mean the ridership numbers, are level or dropping. And by the way, the first time since 2001, <coughs> highway use is increasing. Dropping and now it just recently, classic gas is low for two months. Please use the bus. Um, I, I just want to comment on that really quickly. I use the bus all the time. On Church Street? <laughs> I use the bus wherever I can get in the city. But, but I think that, but I think that um, if there's a chicken and egg thing that goes on with the bus, where you say, we need more ridership, but we need more ridership. Get more ridership, we need to have a better bus system. You know? And and this thing that goes around and around and around and around is, you know, yes, we need more ridership, but we're not gonna get more ridership as long as the, the bus system is is not working as well as it should. I mean, even little things like, you know, uh, the fact that the downtown transit center that was built how many years ago? Two or three years ago. They have never changed the sign on the downtown transit center. Yeah. So you can actually see what bus is there when you come running up to try to catch the bus. You know? Little things like that mean that you know, I'm gonna get in my car. I don't have a car, but I would get in my car and drive <laughs> instead of yeah. taking the bus because it's like the internet. One time if the bus doesn't show up when it's supposed to, you just kind of say, eh, I'm not gonna do that. So Yes, we need more ridership, but we need a better bus system in order to have better bus. And I think it's been pretty good uh, when they started the link. Um, that, that actually worked well. Right? You know, you can get on the bus in Burlington, go right to Montpelier, and then, um, so much so that um, what a great thing. What a great thing. You can sit there in New York or do whatever and take a nap if you want. Um, and uh, they had started adding buses really quickly because it actually was. So we know that uh, we will develop this. Well, let's debate this. Because uh, I have a firm this a lot, like you. Uh, I've been car for since 2002. And uh, I used to train, I love transit, I check out transit. But wherever I go, I buy transit. That's one of my activities. I don't know. Uh, of course, I ride the transit here. Um, you are right. But my point was that it's difficult to do what you want if the ridership is dropping. You're going to say, okay, the ridership is dropping because the reason to be I guess right now we're speaking to an MPA, so maybe it wasn't the best thing to say to MPA, but I often talk to active environmentalists, which perhaps all of them are, but to that community I say, take the bus regardless of which one is. You need the numbers, and that's a community Stop talking about you. Get on. We and, have and friends there. there. There's, there's no doubt that we need. To, we need. We are advocating. We need to keep pushing that. We won't stop that because we will never be as convenient as your own car. No, we can't. <coughs> car pulling is not as convenient. It's got to be ready for some get there. Ready? You know what I mean? It's all these things. I mean, the most convenient way to travel, unless the car has made it so miserable that the person travels. But before the car has made it that miserable, like the world of one has done, of course it's more convenient. People can walk through the kitchen and through the lunch room and into the car without even stepping out of the rooms. You can't mask it. See, your bicycle doesn't, your walking doesn't, and transport. So, yes. Yeah, I'd like to um, mention uh, my proposal about electric passenger vans. Um, there's been some talk about the electric buses, and I talked to the union head, and uh, he said that the big ones didn't have enough power to run on the back. So I don't know about that. But uh, the thing is, the electric bus, the standard size that we have, Plus one million dollars. One bus plus one million dollars. The electric passenger van uh, 
so you know you can't expect that somebody who's reliant on public transportation to access their job that doesn't pay well and they've got kids to get to child care and get to school and all of these other stressors they don't have the luxury of poor service and so i guess my you know i think you're all probably really deeply thinking about this it's obviously a complex complex problem but I guess that's just on my mind at the time. It's like, how do we make that quick switch and do that in a way that supports and embraces all needs? Um, I think that's, that's such a huge challenge. That's just a theme of these conversations each month no matter the topic. Um, one thing that really holds us back in the state is this discussion of taxes. We had the elected governor who was like, no new taxes, no new fees. That was his mantra. And uh, what that means is, uh, he was going to shoot down anything that would have um, that funding source for uh, public transportation. It should be on a gas tax or something like that. That's a new and creative way of funding it. Um, and uh, we just we didn't have the numbers to get things like that through. Um, and I think we could see a real expansion of public transportation when we start funding it. There are some things you can do that are having your Oh, yeah. We can have a sign but there's some things you can yeah. just do. Yeah. Can't just do the other Yeah, but also it doesn't, you know, this thing of, you know, taxes is so evil, and unless we get over that, if we want fair and equitable taxation, that's what we want, not no taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, well I I should I have something? Yes, I did So, uh, uh, I took retrans down to uh, Manchester this summer, and the bus was clean. Uh, it was uh, fast, it was comfortable, and the driver was very courteous. It was a good experience. Retrans down to Manchester, and then I spent the night and came back the next day. It's great. Is that now? Is that subsidized in the state? It must yeah. be. Uh, taxi call for bond trains. Retrans. How many people on this? Uh, 10 or 15. Not enough. Uh, and if anyone wants to talk about uh, trans subsidizing trans transit, trans trans cars trans are the most subsidized things we've got in the transportation sector by far. The trans yes. center. Okay. So, stop me if I'm saying things that. I know that uh, uh, So, Ethan Allen Express is a daily New York train, New York City train from Ralph. Um, when I, had, I used to represent the 80s and 90s and that was something that I worked on with the cars. Now, I talked to about the train, soon after that, I was on it. Uh, and, then, and then I did some consulting, and uh, one of my first contracts was with the city of Burlington to do a cursory study take to extend that train I always knew Burlington was a much better anchor than the clock to squat. A little bit of a not to be a good anchor. Um, a place for the train terminals. And uh, believe it or not, that the study I did for Burlington is dated in 1998. So it's 21 years ago. So we've been trying to get the train up here ever since. Finally, we have all the money in the place Track. It will be here tonight, but the, uh, the tunnels going through the military, right, right through the military. <coughs> They're not really tunnels, they big ditches, but they're big sort of tunnels. Um, and uh, the 60 miles an hour track, uh, most of the way to uh, here, it be about an hour and a half past of New York, where the monitor is, about driving time for seven and a half hours. Only you don't have to park in some suburban parking lot that off the main station. Um, so we never thought, at least I never thought, that any problem was going to store the train and prepare to uh, service it. There was a bit of an issue of turning it around. You can't turn it around. So the issue that I'm sure you are referring to was the storage and service of the train. So the regional planning commission. Did a study of uh, five places to store, all in Birmingham. And one of them is the Union Station. And 
problem with that site is that you know when Union Station went back to the foot of Main Street? Right. Yeah. And to uh, I, don't, I agree, and I don't think that should be the place. And here's the problem. It's by far the cheapest. That's pretty much it. Um, the best place would be inside of the yard, from on the railway, and they, they cannot they do not have an Amtrak train sitting there. They, they're not allowed to move it. Only the Amtrak person people can uh, drive the train. Um, another site is actually down this way. It's, uh, Flynn Avenue, where Flynn crosses the tracks, almost yeah. right there in the south. From there. Uh, there's a siding, the Mount Railway claims you can't use that siding, so we have to move the siding. The double track issue, I don't believe we actually have to build another track by the, by the station. But again, what the Mount Railway is claiming is that they need that. And frankly, I think. Just using this opportunity, I see an opportunity which is we're trying to get the Amtrak train in here and say, okay, fine, keep it in the station but on a second track. So their existing main line is first of their train. Uh, and that is probably a more valid concern on their part than just building a second track. If Amtrak is not still there, that's all I'm saying. Because right there, that's the Yes, that's interesting. Uh, since 1998, like 18, 20 years, it was south of Yeah, well, I mean, that is how things go, but obviously, not everything to get the train started as a similar, and then we But now I understand how many train cars are there? Two, four, eight? No, there would be, I think it's five on the laundry now, so it's probably going to be four. So that's not a lot of train? Nope, it's not that long. Why do you have to run all night? That's the big problem. <coughs> you didn't have to run all night, you didn't be quiet. Uh, there was only one Amtrak. Places. And Amtrak, there's only one thing green about it, and that's the inherent great efficiency of steel wheels and steel wheels. That's it. Other than that, they couldn't care less about it. They don't care about it. You can't even reuse a coffee cup right. on Amtrak. So, um, so they have no problem with these the engine Why do they have to? They don't. It's well, not well, yeah, why don't we have a rule in Vermont and Burlington? You can't run your train all night. We cannot control things like that. Well, maybe no, we should. Well, no, the Federal Railroad Association uh, and, uh, administration is. Uh, it's in, I just believe every city in the nation is allowing Amtrak to run their trains all night. Amtrak has committed to not running it all night on the day. They committed to that. They committed to that. Yes. All right, so people that don't seem to know that in the recording. No. So it'll be quiet. Right? Yeah, quiet. It's, it's, yeah, but that is the biggest deal. Plus, as much the second track is being noisy all night. I think the people most concerned do, do understand that they're concerned about the servicing. The uh, you know the toilets get empty uh, the service thing. Uh, on the track? No. <laughs> well, then you know, the not going to get toilets. No, I think we're trying to get out there. No, I'm mindful of time and just with my charge of keeping us on schedule here and getting to our next folks, Representative Sullivan and Representative McCormick. Thank you so much for coming to the is there anything that you want us to know coming to the legislature to keep in mind and last party work they have for this group? I really appreciate it. The one thing I have, I'm, there's nothing like citizen advocates. When we're doing something where we're up against, uh, you know, in, in building lobbyists and other legislators, a little nervous, there's nothing like um, hearing from constituents. So keep those calls coming. Great.
JR Clinton from Star for the City. We're tag teaming, so you may have heard um, it doesn't affect most people, um, but we are working. We are working on readdressing some properties. So your your physical address for your home on a few properties. So back in the early 90s, when 911 was adopted, um, there were there were standards on house numbering. The city of Burlington got a waiver, um, as did some other communities. But where it really affects us here in some of the condo developments where there are numerous buildings all with the same address. So in Austin Drive, down in the South End, for instance, there were 29 buildings all with 80 Austin Drive. That makes it a real challenge for us to find that which building we're going to. So there were apartment numbers, and but that, ne that wasn't necessarily easy to locate. And so with and what really, um, while well, we had kind of figured workarounds, what people start to get frustrated when your Amazon package doesn't deliver, your pizza van can't find you. And so we knew we've had this problem for years, but we um, we 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 are finally elected to push it so and, and, and fix it really. And so that we can better find uh, when an emergency occurs, find you. So what happened was we opted to tackle uh, 80 Austin Drive, these 29 units, 100 and 171 address. 171 address points uh, for, for for that complex. That was our first out of the gate endeavor. So we started it in um, May, probably April or May of 19. So not that long, uh, but getting consensus because it required new street names um, and then the approval of numbering. There's a system. And so we're almost there. December 1, that complex is going to live. But then we're going to move right down the street to 161 Austin Drive, which then has how many occupancies there? Uh, they have a of 40 units now. Yes. So, and with four different condo associations. So you may have seen a little bit of feedback on Front Porch Forum about some frustrations with um, street numbering. Uh, we understand that if you had an address for a long time, such as 80 Austin Drive apartment, you know, 452, and now we're going to give you your a new shot, a new street with a new number. You may be confused about why that is, but ultimately, it's so that we, in you know, an emergency, from us, our, our standpoint, the police department standpoint, we can pinpoint where you are. So uh, that's what we're doing. We have a few other. Uh, we we took the top 15 projects in the city that uh, are the most problematic. And we're almost at another one. <laughs> Two more work five to work. About 61 and then and then uh, Harbor Harbor Watch. Harbor Watch is the last one. Yeah. I was gonna say if the post office wanted to rebuild itself, my PO box is secure. And I have business. And it's 20 years since we had business. What they did is they gave me a PO box and I got a discount. But they gave me a bunch of, I don't know, labels or postcards or something written up so that I could use those to let everyone know my address has changed. Jay actually does almost all the work. He works with uh, I just say that help. the postal service, all the city departments, dispatch, 911, phone companies, Rollington Electric Department, and then my associate with the state 911 office. He does uh, Google Maps, FedEx, UPS. So uh, our new road names in Wedgwood are in Google now. Where are they? Yay. What are the, what are the new names? Uh, new street names are Wedgwood Circle, and then uh, that serves Wedgwood 1 and South, and then the other piece of it has two short streets, Conifer Court and Pine Ledge Lane. I did not choose those. I worked with people to hopefully come up with the names that they like. Um, and if they can't, then I'll do it. <laughs> so yes, it's, it's just condo complexes that are being? Not necessarily. No. But those, but those are the big ones. Um, uh, where's the, the, I'm thinking some other ones that maybe not condo complexes. Our priority ones are, are multi unit things, either uh, like uh, Northgate. Uh, North Shore, uh, the uh, co-housing project on the staff, uh, 
Um, we do have a few houses in the country club. It's on that list. Yes. Um, but mainly it's condos. Ma mainly, mainly, condos. Yeah, mainly it's condos. There is a, um, a basically a cul-de-sac over off Grove Street of single-family homes that is goofy in the same kind of manner, and so we're that that will eventually get there. So the the big ones, you know. 80 Austin Drive, there's a lot of addresses there. We go there frequently, and it's a frustration on the dispatch center or the state system when someone calls 911 trying to geolocate which building is that. And so this is. So the the address numbers are distance based. Well, so you know uh, how far from the beginning. It's a thousand addresses a mile. So if your address number of your house is 500, that tells the fire department, police department, so that's a half mile down the road. So there's a lot of lots of people. Doesn't make everybody happy. Uh, Amy earlier when you brought up the question of accessory dwelling units and the fact that the city is now promoting uh, accessory dwelling units as a mm -hmm. as a housing option. Um, I live in an accessory dwelling unit, and I happen to know that when I talked to Jay when we were renumbering, you know, finding a number for our house. And um, the, the accessory dwelling unit is in back of 52. We are 54. Um, will uh, emergency vehicles uh, find us? Because Amazon has a hard time. And uh, other delivery, uh, the post office has a hard time when there's a new carrier on. Um, how, how do you deal with those kinds of situations? Well, you know, I, I make sure that the Postal Service has the information. And with the accessory dwelling unit, if the, if the unit is inside your house, then your house tag is like three, uh, 30 Maple Street, and the accessory unit will be unit one, 30 Maple Street, unit one. If it's a detached, which I believe yours was, then it gets, if the, it's like in the top floor of the garage and back, and it's detached, separated, then they get their own number. Um, now, a lot of the city is not distance based, and I'm not going to try to change that. Uh, they simply sequence in order up the street, and so I, you know, we do our best to, to fit, find a number that fits in logically. Uh, the new stuff, or where I'm doing complete re addressing job, then we could go distance based. Ashley, did you have a question? Yeah, I just, uh, I live in Red Rock, so I'm really excited that you guys are going to come and make it so people can come to the house. Um, when you do it, can you guys put stuff on the mailboxes at each of the different locations? Because I think there are a lot of rentals back there. My landlord is not going to tell me what you guys are doing. I just, like, never hear from him. And I would love to know what my new number or address is going to be. We haven't calculated those yet. The, the, the drive going in is probably the Red Rock Drive, um, and then that other street that goes off, I'm, I don't know what the name was, I threw out a name of Granite Street just because rocks, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, we have found it a challenge with, to, to communicate well, so we started to work through the boards and then yeah. realized that that doesn't necessarily uh, translate to them. So we had, we had a great plan back in June and had this, we thought, done, and then realized even though we had board support, we didn't have uh, owner support. And uh, kind of, we had to call a pause. So I, I know we need to get to do a better way of getting the information. Those mailbox areas are pretty good. People put all sorts of good stuff on us. So, so the numbering and uh, your unit numbers, building number one, that's the responsibility of the property owner. Or in your case, the uh, associate, which is so whatever association you're in, so that that is borne by the uh, by the property owners. And uh, similarly, if if it's a private street, the city will put up the street sign. But if it's a private street, then the people have to pay for that. Um, I'm working that out with them, but I think we're gonna get a pretty good deal on that. So well, hopefully, you hear something soon. I just wonder, is this all going to be covered in GPS? <laughs> it is. Is it statewide or just in oh, yeah, the other Google Maps too? Yes, yeah, so we, 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 we push that information out to Google, so it'll, it takes a little while for it to get into the system, but in case of the, those streets are already in there. So that will ultimately, that will be one of the, so your delivery person can find it yeah. as well, or the taxi or Lyft. Or. And you can also put your numbers out so people can see them. Oh, and, uh, 
So the 911 program, the way that works is you call in and you give them your address, they'll put it up and they'll see on a map exactly which house it is. And so, and then the people in the truck or the car, they're looking at it too. Yeah. So when it's working, it's really efficient and they can find it quickly. So in our work specifically, the only renumbering is the conduct complex. Yeah, ADL 161 and Harbor and Watch. Those are the reward value. Yeah. Okay. The rest of you are spared. <laughs> but we did want to, if, again, uh, so good, good we had some one customer, um, but it was a little controversial and where it was some fun front porch forum posts that perhaps we didn't, we didn't do a good enough job getting it. But uh, yeah, I, so I was going to initially send an invitation to you all and we did so in response to some information that our steering committee received as, as a group from some folks in Ledgewood who were uh, paying attention to this and so uh, I just want to extend a thank you for being responsive and for coming here and for sticking out to the end of the meeting. We certainly let those folks know that uh, you were going to be here tonight and uh, allow me to sort of extend an invitation to as this project moves forward in Ward 5 if you want to uh, lean on the NPA capacity to get that word out uh, or to use this as a forum, uh, we're here for that, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't really have a good strategy, and I think now that we, the more we talk about it, we figured maybe we should do a ward at a time as opposed to um, jumping around. So, where at least it gets the discussion going in a neighborhood, finish that neighborhood, and move on to the next. That's important. Yeah. These conversations always make me just astounded and very grateful at the level of detail that goes into making a community work. Yeah. You know, from the street side and the questions and the conversation, it's astounding. It blows me away. So, like Ben said, we really appreciate you sticking it out to the end, having this conversation, and hope you'll come back to join us. You're very welcome. That's right. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone.